Good morning. Just bring your coffee and sandwiches and whatever you like. I was very, very loud right now, I think. I wake up everyone who has their office here too. So great to be here. Uh, have a, our special guest of today who's going to take you a journey up to the moon, I think, somehow. Somehow, yeah. The we'll entrepreneurial see. trip to the moon. Yep. Landed or, or on the or moon. Or beyond the moon. Or beyond the moon, even. That's good. That's good. And uh, for you, uh, those of you who were here the first morning boost, you heard you uh, you should uh, try to reach for the stars and you will aim the treetops. You remember that from Abdarisak Adam, who was here. But today we are going to listen to a very exciting uh, story about your um, company. And your founder is also here today, um, Nadan Kokar, who is here as well. I think you're going to tell a little bit about the story from the beginning. Yep. I think you feel like at home in this building as well. I do recognize it, uh, recognize it pretty well. It's uh, changed a little bit since we were here. but That's good, because th uh, there are some couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to see that it has changed. Actually, it started 2003. 2002 even. 2002 even. Yep. When you went to uh, Chalmers School of Entrepreneurship yep. with your colleague Friedrich Lindberg. No, Hendrik Blücher. Yep. And you were then students and you needed a real good idea to develop and do something good and make something good of. Yep. And then you had the opportunity and uh, t to meet your still colleague in your company, yep. uh, Nandan. And also your colleague who you work with, I think, Friedrich Wienberg. And uh, you became the team of Oxion. That's correct. And many of you think, oh my god, two, three years, that's a fortune of time. And I want my company to be a uh, success in two years. And I think that maybe was your goal and what you were aiming for in the beginning too. That but was definitely the plan. It's <laughs> almost 20 years ago right now. Yeah. But uh, we, we have the topic of today going uh, from lab to landing on March. And I changed it a little bit and I wrote going from Chalmers School of Entrepreneurship to landing in Borås. Yeah, it's about the same. It's about yeah. the same, isn't it? So I'm not the one who's going to talk today. Let me introduce, or we already have introduced today's speaker, Andreas Matman. Warmly welcome. Thank you. All right, great to be back uh, 20 years later. It's uh, p time pass pretty quick and it's important to have fun. We've been having fun with developing, selling and marketing carbon fiber fabrics for all sorts of applications that needs to be ultra lightweight and perform, perform well in different ways. I won't tell too much about our products or our technology, but I thought I'd just mention what we do. So we sell rolls of this carbon fiber fabric, which we, which then goes in different sorts of production of composite parts, ice hockey sticks, airplane wings, um, tanks for cryogenic hydrogen, um, Mars helicopters, batteries, etc., etc. So that's what we do. We have our production facility in Borås, um, and we sell on a global on a global market. This is how it all started here at Chalmers with Nandan uh, presenting to the School of Entrepreneurship uh, his brilliant idea of uh, weaving using tapes instead of yarns. Uh, the model of the weaving loom was what we started off with. That was the technology presented to us and we started to try to find applications area where this technology could be used. Nandan had a long, long list of potential application areas whereof composite reinforcements was, uh, was one. So after first having one business model where we were supposed to produce machines sitting on the back of tractors producing geotextiles on the fly uh, in when building roads we quickly uh, throw that in the bin after having it after having it had it reviewed by venture cup i think actually 
uh, that pointed us in, in a good direction. Uh, we focused instead on, on uh, reinforcement structures for, for composites. Um, so this is a while back when uh, the four students that was in, in the School of Entrepreneurship went on our first uh, trade show, actually, basically. Um, meeting customers, trying to understand needs, trying to understand how could this material that we are able to produce in Nandan's brilliant machine, how could that be used? Um, we had some good guidance with from Friedrich, Nandan's partner, who, who presented to, to the School of Entrepreneurship as well, and uh, a few other uh, people with more experience than us at the time. As you can see, we didn't have that much gray hairs, nor experience, but we had a ton of energy, which uh, have proven to be needed. But out and meet customers, that's, that's how we started to understand what we, what we could offer, how we should offer it, and, and how we could adapt our business model. Uh, it has been challenging, obviously, the last couple of years to meet customers, uh, but you have to find other means, Teams, Zoom, all those applications that you've uh, learned very well by now, I'm sure. Uh, we set out with, uh, with an idea of delivering l machines initially when we went to the show. Uh, we thought we would produce weaving looms because that's what Nandan had provided to us. Uh, so we went around the show and, uh, and looked for information about how those companies wanting to use those machines, how they would, how they would approach customers, what, what they saw from their customers, what they need, and showed small pieces of material that we thought we could produce. Um, but we learned pretty quick during the show that, that this might not be the best idea. So when we got back home, we switched business model and said we should deliver fabric instead. So we should build our own machines, keep, keep full control of those and the process and deliver material. So from being out there meeting our first customers, we changed business model. We uh, went back and we actually closed our first deal with BMW. That was the very first, that was the very first uh, order we got. I still have it framed. <laughs> I don't think BMW knew which company they were buying from. And we didn't know how to deliver this because we had no machine. It was almost in the making, I would say. So Nandan quickly got to the drawing board, did a ton of uh, extremely complicated drawings in your very sophisticated uh, software, <laughs> in yeah, kind of paint, if you know what paint is, roughly. Uh, and he managed to do a drawing with thousands of pieces, um, which we had manufactured out in in the woods, in a big city called Fritzla, really out in the countryside. Um, had a brilliant man called Jungblad who helped us out there building this first machine um, based on Nandan's drawings. And uh, when we had finally got all parts together, I remember it very well because Nandan went to the other side of the machine and he looked at the machine and said, wow, I've never seen the machine from this side before. <laughs> so in Nandan's head, he had a drawing of those thousands of parts, how they would all fit together. He had only produced drawings of each part for, for the guy who's doing the machine. And it all fit together. I think it was one piece that needed to be remachined. Everything else came together extremely well, and we were able to deliver to BMW after some struggle. Uh, we had to work pretty hard on the machine, as you can see, for every centimeter that we wanted to produce, it took a little while. I think we did, we were extremely 
lucky and glad when we had been able to make eight meters in a day. And today we have we are up to roughly 15, 20 meters per hour at a much bi bigger width. We also got the first funding secured at that time from uh, uh, Shalmash, what is today Shalmash Ventures, basically. Uh, continue to meet customers, understand their needs, adapt and, uh, and, uh, and try to see where we could fit, uh, where could we find our, our first customers that are willing to take the risks that are after lighter weight, better performance. Uh, we found F1, which was a brilliant way of proving the technology and getting some, some grip in, in, in uh, volumes of, of some sort. Even though it was not big, it was quick. A race team could almost test, or, or you could present for a race team on Thursday. They test it on Friday, and they would ra race the material Saturday. It is quite different from the aerospace industry, I can tell. <laughs> we are still struggling to get in there, and we've worked quite closely with Airbus and Boeing for 10 years, and we're still 10 years away, I would say, from being on a structural part of an aircraft. So persistence is needed if you want to go <laughs> into aerospace. We continued to meet customers, understand needs. We expanded in sporting goods and we built up our production, started to industrialize things. It was a huge day when we had our first pallet to ship out. So we had built a factory of some, of some sort and we had found some customers uh, needing our material in 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 a scale where where it came to came to yeah came to the point where we could actually deliver one pallet of material that was a big day. It's quite different now. Uh, those type of applications are areas where extreme performance is needed and ultra lightweight. Um, we help the customers to design their tennis racket or their sail for the for the race boat or their helmet or golf shaft and how uh, and we guide them in how to apply to extreme in the best possible way and those type of applications made us made us get going and uh, we could we could finally take off it took us roughly eight, seven, eight years um, to become the Super Gazelle. So we were the fastest growing company in, in 2010 of, uh, in Sweden. Uh, it's easy to, be, to grow fast when you start from a low level because they measure things in, <laughs> in rates, in percentage. So it's, uh, it's, it's, rather s it, it's pretty easy. But we were best, which was a lot of fun. We got a lot of... Uh, a lot of attention, um, a lot of interest, and uh, we started to look at what's next. Um, and we felt that even though we were the fastest growing company in Sweden, we felt that we were not growing fast enough. We where, where are we going after this? We got uh, new investors involved at that time, and we reassessed the growth potential within sports that had never really been our main focus but we we uh, we had kept that as an important part of our of our business model and at that point we had not uh, we had not focused so much on aerospace and industrial applications but when when the new investors got in and we reassessed the potential markets we saw that that's where we need to go we need to change focus to totally focus on aerospace and industrial uh, because it has a much bigger potential, but also uh, when you are in a sports application, they need to change things every year. So they need, it's good that they test things quickly, but they also throw things out pretty quickly. 
even though we are still in Formula One and we are in still in most of those applications in sporting goods uh, that you saw on that slide. So they hang in longer than you think, but it is quicker. If you get into an aircraft, you are there for 30, 40 years until end of that end of life of that aircraft, because they it's 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 a real pain to get materials qualified and specced into an aircraft. So you do not want to change. Uh, and that's the struggle when you try to get in, but it's also great when you are finally in. Uh, we moved to new facilities in uh, Borås. We had moved to Borås five years earlier because that's where, uh, where we had most of the textile competence in Sweden and we also found a good place to, to locate our production there. Uh, we moved into our new facilities in 2012. Uh, we formed Oxion Inc., our US subsidiary, in 2010. So that was a couple of years before. Uh, but those things uh, all evolved and we started to look at, to get into the commercial aircraft industry, we needed strategic partners. There is no way we could be a supplier into Boeing or Airbus by ourselves. We need to team up with others. So those were some important keystones again. So continue to be out there, meet customers, understand needs and adapt our business model to different markets, different needs. And as you can see in this show, we have divided our offer and tried to separate our sporting goods customers from our aerospace and industrial customers because they have different needs. And it's different messages that we need to send. Uh, finding out how how things work in 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 your customers different application areas that is by far the most important thing and that's what's that's the only learning you I think you need to bring here <laughs> bring from here today out talk to customers and understand and, and adapt it's as simple as that then everything else will follow and I know that you are into into this and that it has been challenging during those last couple of years to to do that but it's extremely important to to get into the heads of your customers and understand what what how can we help them because that's why we're here we have been able to get into a bunch of different aerospace applications um, we are in the aircraft seats of uh, Heiko. Those seats are on the A350. That was our first uh, entrance into the aerospace interior market. We are on a bunch of different drone programs. The one you see in the picture here is a prototype. The others that are flying are mostly not, we're not able to share anything about those different types of drones. We're also in a few programs about uh, rocket fuel tanks, basically, or hydrogen and liquid hydrogen storage tanks, which is another really interesting area for, for air aircrafts and spacecrafts. And we are on Mars, which is a pretty amazing achievement. And I will get back to that later on a little bit more. Uh, so, as I told you, we we said we needed to change focus. We needed to find market with a, a greater potential where we could continue our growth, even though it's it was quick in the sporting goods industry in the beginning. It came to a plateau and, and haven't moved a lot since then, actually. Uh, and we know that it is good to be in, in industrial and aerospace applications as we said before but what we had not foreseen was that we are of course totally trapped in our customers development timelines there is no way boeing would listen to us when we tell them could you please release your new aircraft a couple of years earlier they would always delay and delay and delay and that's that's when it comes to all those type of industrial or aerospace applications uh, being a supplier, material supplier into this value chain. 
we are out of control of our own timeline as well. So we're totally trapped in, in, in their potential issues. Um, if, if we are entering into a new aircraft that is supposed to supply internet by being in the atmosphere, so there we are in a few of those programs where they have produced or are, are about to produce an aircraft that will be above the regular air traffic but below the satellites. And they want to have those plane up for months. They are big, ultralight, and it's a perfect fit for our materials. But they have been delayed and delayed and delayed. And even if it's a great customer, when it finally takes off, we are out of control again. So that's another example. And so, so our question recently has been, how do we take control of this timeline? How do we... How do we get past this? Because being a supplier into, into those programs is our ultimate goal. We need to get there and that's when the volumes will finally come. So, so far, we believe the answer is this. We have created two subsidiaries where we own the next step in the value chain. So Carbo Seal is a product to reline district heating pipes, where we've been involved as a material supplier since January 2014. They were delayed and delayed and delayed, and end of 19, we ended up buying the company. So we took control of our timeline. <laughs> so now I spend a lot of time meeting district heating customers. So again, meet, meet customers, understand needs, and adapt, but in a totally new field. And this I've done during the pandemic. So the first orders that I was able to close, I did solely on Teams. I did never meet with a customer. And I've still actually not met the customer who made the decision. I've only met the people who installed it at the installation place. But this has given, at the, given us the opportunity to, to be in control of our, of our timeline. As a material supplier, we, we, could, we could not affect how quickly the previous owners of Carbo Seal would, would be able to grow or introduce their product to the market. Same thing with the, with the speaker membranes, where where we also did not find a good fit down the value chain that could take our material and bring it to the market. So there we also started up our own subsidiary delivering speaker membranes. And I recall from, from when we were at the School of Entrepreneurship in the very early part of our studies, I think it was even before we met with Nandan, we had some classes about the challenge as an entrepreneur of of uh, proving your technology and, and bringing it all the way. It's pretty easy to say that we should only focus on this particular step in the value chain because that's where we make the most money. But then you are totally dependent on everyone else in the value chain. And I think you need to bear that in mind in the early days that maybe you need to take a much bigger part of the value chain to make sure that you are in control of your own timeline. Maybe you need to find some application areas where, where this is possible, where the investments are not too big or where you can do that or where you can find partners that are very well fit for you. And this goes if you have a part of a, uh, a part of a, if you are in a material supplier or a supplier of, of an ingredient, so to say, I'm running out of power so I better plug in otherwise it'll go black before the before the video of the main event of today and it's not of me so those are the two subsidiaries we have now. 
we have a few other areas that we're looking into possibly doing the same thing. Um, and hopefully this is the answer on how to take control of our timeline. <laughs> and then this will buy us time to get into, get into the commercial airspace as well, because there we need the partners, as I mentioned earlier. We will not be able to deliver to Airbus or Boeing as a company out of Borås with 50 employees. We need strong partners there. And we, we have those lined up, but the aerospace industry have got a pretty hard hit from the pandemic, as you could imagine. Um, so it's not, it's not the best climate now. However, our projects are still alive, which is good. And there is a lot of talks about hydrogen, nit liquid hydrogen. A lot of money and research money is going in that direction. So in ab about the time where we said that that we need to refocus from from uh, sporting goods to aerospace and industrial, we had some contacts with NASA. Uh, this was when we set up Oxion Inc. Jim, our guy in the US, uh, sold some material to them, and he had he heard some rumors of what they were developing, but then he didn't hear for them from them for for a wh for a quite a while. He had some discussions. It was a pair of wings they wanted to do, uh, and they they needed our lightest possible material. Uh, so he provided them with a few alternatives. They bought some material uh, and went into their development rooms for six, seven years, something like this. And then in 20, 2017 or 2018, they bought uh, one roll of material, so not a lot, but they bought some material. And uh, then we got to know what it was they were working on. And it was this. Uh, so they were planning to do a helicopter that could fly on Mars. Since the air is extremely thin up there, th the rotor blades have to move with an incredible speed. So it has to be super light and extremely thin. That's where we have our perfect fit with our carbon fiber. So the big checkerboard material on the wings, that is extreme. We are also on the substrate of the solar panels at the top and in the box below the helicopter. So we were, of course, super excited about possibly being one of the first materials from Sweden on Mars, because there has been no other one on Mars before. Uh, and we were super excited, or even more excited, when it was supposed to fly, because that's the ultimate proof. What NASA wanted to do was they wanted to prove that it is possible to fly on Mars so that they could, for future adventures, uh, possibly use drones to, to find, find out more about Mars or to guide other vehicles on the ground. They, their objective with Ingenuity was to do three, five flights, something like this, to just prove that it could fly there. So on April 25th, I believe it was, 19th, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this year, um, Ingenuity was about to take off. And we, of course, watched it with a lot of excitement. Is it... I remember sitting and trying to see if it was moving, but I didn't see anything, just like you. At least it is on Mars.
now something was happening, right? It was as exciting as when I looked at it. <laughs> so it's worked. And it has been delivering far beyond expectations. It has now done 13 flights. And they've been able to guide the rover, the, 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 the car or the vehicle, um, to, to places where they wouldn't have gotten without Ingenuity. So it's been doing a great job. Uh, and it has been, of course, uh, really cool to, to be able to send something to Mars. It's not a huge volume, but it is a great proof of what we do is of the highest possible quality. They would not send anything else to Mars. Okay, that's, I think, um, there was one question, how do you keep motivation up? That was the main focus. And when it takes uh, 20 years to get there, it's more of a marathon than a sprint. And my answer to that is what I've told you now many times already. Meet customers, understand the needs and adapt. That's it's as simple as that, and that keeps you motivated because when you meet people and understand that you could help them with their challenges, that's what at least drives me. And then having a great team behind being able to actually do what I tell them when I sell, <laughs> it's also important. <laughs> All right.